TV taught me how to dream. It was a life jacket. I don't think you can be an artist and not touch people. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Morning Combat channel. My name is Luke Thomas. I am one half of the hosting duo. I am joined by the gentleman on the other side of the screen. He is your other host. We're both from CBS Sports. That's Brian Campbell. We are joined today with a very special guest. He is the president of Showtime Sports, a man about town, and a whole lot more, a lot to discuss. It is the one and only Stephen Espinosa. Stephen, how are you doing here in this... Uh, Seventh, eighth, nine month of the quarantine, whatever the hell we're in at this point. Huh. That's a uh, that's a loaded question. How much time do we have here? <laughs> uh, not a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. We actually have a lot to let's, get to. So I will assume that. it's pretty good. We're, we're all still employed. We're all still relatively healthy. Let's uh, let's call that a win, right? Fair enough. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I'd like to go first if I can, Stephen. I've been watching the All Access so far. We know we're, at this point, uh, as we record this, uh, a week and some change away from Gervonta Davis getting back to the ring against Leo Santa Cruz. A couple of things to note. Obviously, all of Showtime's fights to this point, well, I should say since the pandemic anyway, have been at the Mohegan Sun. Brian and I were there for the Charlo doubleheader. It went off without a hitch, it seemed like. This one will not be there. You guys moved it to San Antonio, Texas. Why the change? Well, the, the, the reality, um, it's largely, I think, financial, which was a decision made by TGB and PBC. Um, but I, I think, you know, uh, part of the decision was also looking around and seeing that there are sporting events going on with limited crowds. Um, and, you know, knowing that the crowd and the enthusiasm, the adrenaline of, of the live event is a big part of boxing. So uh, I, I think... You know, the, the promoters decided, look, this is the time is right. Let's try and get in front of the crowd a little bit more revenue, but maybe uh, more importantly, uh, a better connection with fans, you know, and really to be able to get out there. Because the, the reality for boxing to continue to operate the way it has been, we're going to have to get back in front of crowds. I mean, particularly with the smaller shows, which obviously this one is not. But, uh, you know, the non-televised shows, the regional shows, the club shows, all those shows which develop one fighter, um, young fighters, um, before they get to the showtime level, those need crowds. You know, they're not financially viable otherwise. So I think this is a move to sort and see if, um, you know, if this will work and, you know, maybe it's something that, you know, the sport can get a little bit back to normal. Steven, I don't know if you're an NBA fan. I would consider myself a, a decent fan, mostly of the Washington Wizards, which is a, a painful, painful relationship. But I did notice something <laughs> for their limited time in the bubble down there in Orlando. I did notice something. The NBA really said, okay, if we're not going to have fans, let's see if we can figure out how to shoot this a little bit differently. And they added a bunch of new camera angles. Now, I know you are going to have fans for this, and the Mohegan Sun is not as big as with the standard arenas that the NBA has access to. Still, I do wonder, have you at all thought about this process? Is there a new way to shoot boxing? Is there, a, from a production standpoint, could the bar be raised in different ways? Yeah, you know, it's, it's an excellent question. It's a question we ask ourselves consistently every show. Um, on, a, on a typical championship show, um, we've got, you know, somewhere 13, 14 cameras, um, which, you know, obviously doesn't compare to the NFL, which might have, you know, three or four times that many. But you've also got a 20 by 20 ring as opposed to a 100 yard playing field. So, you know, there is a limit to what we can do with a 25, uh, 20 by 20 uh, setup. But we do do more reverse angle. We've got some angles which, in, you know, in a full crowd, uh, we probably couldn't use because we get complaints from fans and from the promoter because there'd just be too much in the way. So I, I think hopefully there are some good things that come out of this period, and, and maybe there are some things that permanently stick. Uh, Steven, fired up for this pay-per-view, as so many fans are as well. Halloween night, the Alamo Dome. Really, the story is this rising star, Gervonta Tank Davis. We've called him the Mike Tyson of the lower weight classes, and we certainly expect a great challenge from Leo Santa Cruz and the unique element of the two world titles at stake. Certainly don't want to overlook that. But just like the Charlos last month, this is about Gervonta Davis sort of you know, stepping up to the plate and finding out uh, from your end, from the PBC's end, what his value is. 
headlining a pay-per-view. And the comparisons to Floyd are certainly obvious given their relationship and maybe the gap of the next great American star at the moment in boxing. There's almost this weird way to say it, though. Floyd's fame came later in his career after he had already established himself critically as the best pound-for-pound fighter in the world. And he was certainly brilliant in the way he used the persona and his character. Yet Tank at an underage seems to have, uh, you know, a head start from the standpoint of attracting celebrity fans and really building a younger audience. Can you speak to that specifically on the idea of when you guys sat down and said, is he ready right now? I've seen more celebrity attendance at his fights than really anyone else in the yeah, sport. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. Um, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Floyd did not, uh, did not have his first pay-per-view until I think age 28. So to see Tank at this stage of his career at 25, um, he's well ahead of, of, of Mayweather. Um, you know, and having said that, I'm not sure that this decision would have been made to go to pay-per-view had we not seen the 2019 results that, that all of us did. And being able to go uh, to Los Angeles and have a near sellout, notwithstanding sort of the loss of the original opponent, Abner Mars, then to go uh, to Baltimore after a long drought of championship fights and reignite that, uh, that community with you know, 12, 13,000 uh, tickets sold. And then to go to Atlanta, another long dormant market and you know, get 15,000 in that arena. If you know, there's not another fighter I, you know, that I can think of, you know, possibly Canelo, but I'm not positive, um, that could go to those three cities and do those kind of crowds, especially when you're talking about two markets like Atlanta and Baltimore. So Tank has something. I'm, I'm not sure exactly what it is uh, because it's, it's hard to put your finger on it, but he is very likable, very charismatic. And what he needed really was a, a dance partner that was his equal. And he, I think, has that in Leo Santa Cruz. And certainly moving the fight to Texas. We know the Mexican-American fan base is so uh, passionate, powerful, that certainly could give Leo a bump right there. But staying with Tank and the relationship with Floyd May- Mayweather, I saw the first episode of All Access. Uh, loved it. Loved Floyd's role in that. Even though, look, I know people will look at it and say, let the kid talk. Why are we getting <laughs> so much Floyd? But to be mm-hmm. honest, Floyd's playing a, a big role right now, not just as promoter of Gervonta mentor, but we're seeing him in the gym. We're seeing him assist lead trainer Calvin Ford and, and really take a, a a big brother role for Gervonta. Obviously, Gervonta's had some troubles outside the ring or maybe even sometimes inside of it that has stunted his growth. How important is this relationship, though, of Floyd Mayweather beyond bringing eyes to him for G- Gervonta's long-term success and fulfilling that great I mean, potential? You can't overstate the importance of Floyd. Um, and it, you know, let's get to the boxing strategy in the in the ring first. But there's an entire, uh, you know, this entire you know, set of expectations and obligations that come along with going on pay-per-view. Um, all the PR obligations, you know, the shooting with all access, everything that involves. It's not just the pressure. There are things that you actually have to do. And, and having the guidance of someone who's been on a pay-per-view for the last half of his career and knowing what to expect, how to sort of ration your energy during fight week when you've got to do satellite media tours when you've got to do uh everything under the sun even in this environment so i think that is as much as anything uh, of great value then in the ring i mean we don't have to explain that uh you know floyd sees things differently i think he brings a, a different perspective a different way of of speaking to him calvin is you know is still the critical part you know he's been with tank since uh since the start, but this is this something that we haven't seen from Floyd before. He certainly has been personally invested in a lot of his fighters, um, and he has seen fighters go to the championship level, like Badu Jack, uh, for example, and or more recently, um, uh, Angelo Leo. But here, we, we've never seen Floyd be as hands-on, engaged, and involved as he is uh, with Tank, and I think it's because this is a big step in Tank's career and you know the sky's the limit and so you know tank has been open to that and he's in vegas and soaking up what you know is really invaluable advice and experience let me piggyback off that if i can Stephen. and i want to preface this by saying i think the relationship again from the outside looking in i'm certainly not there in the granular 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 excuse me details but 
it seems like the relationship between Floyd and Tank is nothing but a positive, and I want to be very clear about that. Plus, as you indicated, mm -hmm. Tank's only 25 years old. He's been something of a visible commodity for many, many years, but you got to remember, I mean, he's still in between 20 and 30, quite literally. But here's my question. At some point, and I don't think we're there yet, at some point he has to be, and I think will be more, than the guy that Floyd Mayweather is really advocating and mentoring. When do you anticipate that kind of transition happening? At some point, he'll be bigger than that, right? I guess we're not there yet, but I do anticipate there having to be this growth process where he really takes that front seat kind of role. Yeah, I think it's a natural thing with, with every fighter. If we look at uh, the range of, of fighters, um, be a pay-per-view or not, across the board, there, there, there's been a point where they've took either you know, very big steps or sort of symbolic steps to uh, put themselves at the head as the captain of their own ship. I mean, if you look at, at something, somebody like Errol or, or Mikey Garcia, you know, there were points when, you know, they began making the decisions and determining that. So, it, you know, it's the natural point. Uh, there is the natural point of a fighter's career to do that. When it happens is sort of, it's a matter of experience and maturity. You're right. At some point it, it will, you know, Tank is... Um, is going to take uh, the training wheels off to the extent that he's he's got them there, um, but you know right now he's he's just soaking up the experience. But uh, yeah, of course, at some point he'll become his old man. He'll be sort of the master of his domain, so to speak, and he'll be the one making decisions and 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 really determining his future for himself. Uh, one more on this, if I may. The fight was originally supposed to, uh, supposed to be, I believe, this weekend. It got pushed back to Halloween night. It's going to be a big night for boxing in general, with that being the crown jewel. And as we indicated, now will be fans in attendance and, and a whole lot more. I feel like I ask you this question almost every year, and I, and I, I don't know why I keep asking it, except I just feel compelled to. Mm. To what extent do you feel like there is overlap between the boxing and MMA audience such that staggering pay-per-views, and I'm not suggesting that it was necessarily the function of Nurmagomedov for the UFC fighting this weekend that caused it, perhaps it was, I'm simply saying, is there pay-per-view fatigue in that way? How do you see the relationship between MMA and boxing pay-per-views trying to coexist in the same month? Well, I, I think the reason why you keep asking the question is because I give you a different answer every time, depending on what's going on in the sport. <laughs> so you Maybe because he's right, an a-hole, exactly. Stephen. Maybe, maybe. That too. So yes, if yes, I ever give you well. the same answer twice in a row, I think you'd probably stop asking it. Um, the answer I'm giving you this year, or at least this month, is, um, you know, I think they are largely separate fan, uh, fan bases. But I think on the, the biggest and most sort of uh, commercial fighters and events, there, there is a fair amount of crossover. Um, you know, when McGregor fights... You know, he's such a personality. There, there are some boxing fans that cross over. Um, when Wilder fights, certainly when Floyd fought, um, there will be crossover that, that probably gets some MMA fans who, who, don't, who don't really follow boxing or, you know, aren't really watching many other events this year, but are, are sucked into something like that. I think Tank is at that point now. I, I think he is commercial enough. He's exciting enough that... I think he is starting to draw from the MMA fan base and the general sports fan base. We've certainly seen that on the East Coast, at least in the Atlanta and, and Baltimore markets. Um, but, you know, in general, you know, the, the, the date change was uh, once it moved to San Antonio, the 24th was taken. Um, and, you know, the UFC's event this weekend is obviously, you know, early afternoon. There wouldn't have been a head-to-head -head conflict, but, you know, at a certain point, um, is it difficult to spend, you know, the the seventy dollars twice in one day? Uh, you know, maybe it's a psychological benefit. You know, sure. Um, but I think when you have two events like uh, like we have, um, you know, it, it is an embarrassment of riches. Um, and, and I think you know, given tanks uh, tanks value and tanks attractiveness, I think you know those two events would have done well whether they're on the same uh, same weekends or a weekend apart. Stephen, this fight, uh, looking forward to it for so many reasons, and we don't mean to downplay, of course, Leo Santa Cruz's chances in this fight, but should he should he win? I don't know what his future is from the standpoint of moving up in weight. 130 is, is already, you know, a, a big move for him. We know, though, that the lightweight division across boxing, 
very stacked at the moment from the standpoint of young future stars. We're talking about the Devin Haney's, the Ryan Garcia's, Tank Davis, uh, obviously Teofimo Lopez Jr. on ESPN last week who scored a massive victory over Vasily Lomachenko, did big ratings, all that stuff. But let's talk about the inside of the game here. When we do morning combat, when Luke says, all right, big win for Lopez, what about him against Haney? What about him against, you know, Gervonta? Look, my knee-jerk reaction from having lived this game as a journalist in this sport is, sorry, UFC fans who came over, it's not that likely. But let's talk about if it is likely. It's not. I'm not naive to the fact that Fox and ESPN worked together very mm -hmm. successfully to pull off Wilder Fury 2. We have seen in the past, Mayweather Pacquiao, HBO and Showtime was a big one. When you see a rising stud like Teofimo Lopez and you know that Gervonta Davis is one as well, and let's say he beats Leo, we don't know. Is it realistic? Is this a fight we could see with Showtime Sports a, a part of it? The, the, the reality, it's always been my theory that um, fights don't happen uh, largely, if not entirely because somebody didn't want them to happen and i mean somebody directly involved in the fight so i don't see scenarios um you know i'm sure you guys will correct me if you believe differently but i don't see scenarios where the promoter fighter manager on both sides wanted the fight and then something got in the way so in other words the networks you know contracts all that other stuff even even money will get out of the way will get resolved some one way or the other if people truly want to fight now you can read into that and apply that theory to all the different situations that we've seen over the years and um you know come up with your own conclusions but you know i i think ryan garcia truly wants the fight i think uh, i think tank would love to fight ryan you know um do the promoters you know want it well, as long as they do, then, you know, the networks won't be a problem. Um, at a certain point, once Floyd and Manny got on the same page in terms of Max uh, of making that fight happen, the networks had a choice. It was either get on board or you're not you're not part of it. Um, you know, those fighters, if they have that opportunity, you're not going to let networks get in the way. So I think, you know, I'd like to be optimistic. I think, you know, that to me is the most attractive fight immediately. Uh, and that's not taking anything away from Teofimo. Um, it was an impressive performance and he's a really bright young star. I think your expectation is he's gonna go to 140 pretty quickly, uh, if not immediately, um, which probably takes him out of the tank conversation for a little bit. Um, but in the meantime, you know, you've got, you've got Tank versus Ryan, you've got, you know, possibly Tank versus Devin Haney, Tank versus uh, Lomachenko, even, you know, let's not forget Gary Russell. Um, you know, that is a, yes. you know, Gary has indicated that he would move up to take that fight. And that is a, a massive, a massive event, particularly in the Baltimore DMV area. All right. I love that optimism. And I'm willing, as a journalist, even to, to change that narrative. I want to be a part of it. I want to live in a world where we all get along. Hopefully, we'll see that not just at the Mayweather-Pacquiao level, but all levels. Uh, I wanted to talk about, you announced the undercard of Tank Davis against Leo Santa Cruz for Halloween. And it's strong. And one name jumps off the page for me, and that's Ruguru, mm -hmm. right? That, that's a guy who, who has built his name as an action fighter who's going to be in a tough fight at 140, I believe, against unbeaten. And Juan Araldis, uh, uh definitely a good matchup there. This is a guy who has shown us in his short history as a well as a big name, dare to be great. He wants all the smoke. He wants everyone. This kind of feels like an under the radar pickup for PBC, and obviously going coming into the absolutely Showtime agree. universe. W tell us about sort of what his potential plans could be moving I, forward. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, it's not often that you get a, a fighter of his caliber on a pay per view undercard, and and for it to happen. The way it did was just a, a tremendous bonus, not just to the network and PBC, but I think to, to anybody who's considering buying this card. Um, there, there's no doubt that he is one of the best fighters at 140. And if he goes to 147, he's going to be one of the best fighters at 147. Um, you know, he's been a little bit off the radar for a lot of, you know, sort of the casual fans. If you didn't follow the World Boxing Super Series. Um, but, you know, we saw a lot of him on Showbox. He, one of the most promising uh, junior welters slash welters to come on around a long time. He 
certainly doesn't lack for confidence. Um, he, he speaks well, he's articulate, he's entertaining, he's charismatic. And, you know, uh, this is, again, nothing against Juan Geraldez. We've had him as, as well. And I, I don't think that that fight is a given. But if he gets past it, um, the sky's the limit for him as well. I mean, he, this is a guy who will be headlining cards um, going forward. There's no question about it. And that's Regis Progre. I, I did use his nickname there, but Luke, Luke's a monster Regis Progre fan, Luke. So I'm just teeing that up for you, bro. Yes, he certainly is. I've had him on my radio show. He uh, He's trained with many UFC uh, celebrities. He actually is a huge MMA fan. Uh, neither here nor there for the moment, though, uh, Stephen. Getting back to Gervonta here for just a second. Let's imagine we did a show today, Brian and I, t- talking about some upcoming fights and what would happen if X won, what would happen if Y won. Let's talk about that as it relates to Gervonta, mm-hmm. right? If he wins, and let's say uh, without controversy, right? Mm-hmm. Sort of whatever that's supposed to mean, knockout, TKO, or some kind of easy decision, right? So he wins without controversy. What is, the, what is realistically possible in terms of the growth he can take from just this one fight? Because it is a big fight. It's the crown jewel of Showtime's schedule, really here for 2020, so certainly post-pandemic. It's a huge opportunity for him. How huge, though? I think the, 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 the question, I think everyone recognizes um, you know, how much he has grown and, and what he has done over the last year in terms of going from somebody who's very interesting to somebody who can actually make a difference in this sport. Um, again, there's not that many fighters who can sell 15,000 tickets anywhere. Uh, but a 25-year-old who can go into a market that has an unboxing forever and sell 15,000 tickets, it, you have to sit up and take notice from a business standpoint. Now, selling tickets is sort of a moot issue right now and for the foreseeable future. But we use that as a proxy. We're always talking about who's the next guy to be the face of the sport. Um, and we all know it takes a couple things. It takes those, uh, those, those sort of those cornerstone fights, you know, the big fights, the big rivalries. But it, it also takes someone who people will pay for, you know, and whether that's pay-per-views, whether that is, you know, pay for tickets. You can't be the star of the sport. You can't carry the sport unless you are driving revenue. Tanks, you demonstrated that without question. Um, you can we can sit here and analyze how he got there and all of that, but you know he's there without question. So I think you know what this will say to him is, you know it will if he wins this fight, it will be the most difficult opponent of of his career. It will be a successful debut on pay per view, and I think that makes it easier to make those other fights because what makes those big fights happen, you know, it's the attraction of actually having, having money. So uh, I, I think uh, that it, it, will, it will grease the wheels, um, I, I think, in getting tanked the fights that everybody wants. Sort of a minor question, but a curious one just the same. A, I guess a two-parter, A or B or one mm-hmm. or two. A, is there a rematch clause? And B, we saw that there was no rematch clause between Lomachenko and Lopez this past weekend, which I found shocking. Uh, so I wonder, is what do you make of that, and, and then point A as well? Uh, I I'm, I don't know if there's a rematch clause. Uh, to be completely honest, I would be uh, surprised if, if there was, um, in some sense, because I, I think you know, with with both of them under the same banner, uh, so to speak, then it, it's less of an issue there. Um, but with uh, with respect to uh, you know Loma and, and Lopez. You know, the question is, was that a little bit of arrogance on the Lomachenko side? I mean, normally in that kind of matchup, you, you'd want it there. You could make the same argument that I just made. They're both under the same banner. Um, you know, it shouldn't be hard to make a rematch. Uh, but, you know, perhaps it had something to do with, uh, you know, maybe Top Rank knew that that, Loma, that Lopez would be moving up very quickly right after. And, you know, at 135, it was already a stretch for Lomachenko. Yes, it was... Um, Somewhat surprising, but, you know, I guess you could look at the other way. Um, you know, a lot of times guys are, you know, too confident to worry about a rematch clause. BC? Steven, we're, we're a big fan of uh, 
Showtime documentaries, documentaries in general in these parts. I mean, we flipped our, our shit, as they say, for Tiger King there. So shout out to the great Joe Exotic there. <laughs> and uh, we loved having Greg Kelly stop by the Morning Combat Universe and that fantastic uh, Outcry series you had as well. We know you ex executive produced a lot of these. And uh, whenever we try to sell the Showtime app to people, good God, check out the Jeff Beck one, the damn Suge Knight <laughs> one, the Eagle. I mean, I like, go on and on here. But specifically, the, the most recent one, uh, Bad Hombres, had a chance to check that out. And I loved it. I loved uh, the struggle here of this Mexican League baseball team, which has a history uh, of playing on the border, Laredo, Texas, Nuevo, Laredo, Mexico, and, and sort of serving as the home team for two countries. And knowing your backstory of growing up in a, in a border city of El Paso, uh, how personal was this project to you? And, uh, and, and what did you make of it all encompassing? Um, it was it was definitely a, a, a personal endeavor, a personal story for me. I grew up on the border uh, in El Paso. Um, also, I, I, I grew up um, selling hot dogs for the minor league uh, baseball team in El Paso. Um, nice. So I'm not saying that that played you know a huge role in uh, in the decision, but uh, you know there it, it it was it did ring true. It did resonate with me, um, you know, based on my experiences. But, you know, the interesting thing, and I think this holds true for most, if not all, sports stocks, is what makes them interesting isn't just, hey, let's revisit a sporting event that was big or that you enjoyed. Sure, the hardcore fan loves that. But what really gets people engaged is where you use sports to look at other issues. You, you lose, use it to look at, at race or politics or society. And you look at the intersection uh, of those two things. Um, you know, if we look at, you know, Greg Kelly is one thing, you know, that was not per se a sports doc, but it was set at the intersection of sports and, 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 and justice and, and questions of truth. Um, you know, one of, you know, probably the most well-known doc, if you, you talk about the OJ doc, was, you know, was a crime doc, a football doc, a social history of Los Angeles altogether in one. And I think that that was our model for Bad Hombres is how does this team, which plays its home games, you know, half on the U.S. side, half on the Mexican side, how can we use this to look at border life and border issues, which have become such, uh, such have become at the forefront of things, given the way um, the current administration, you know, addresses these things and makes them issues. And I think, you know, from my standpoint personally. What intrigued me was being able to share with people. Growing up on the, the border, I know the difference between what life on the Mexican-American border is like versus what the rhetoric is. Um, and, and that's not to take any particular stand on, on immigration one way or the other. It's just the rhetoric doesn't match what is happening on the ground. And I think this was an opportunity to say, to look at this baseball team and the story of this baseball team dealing with cross-border issues, you know, living and working in a community that deals with cross-border issues and see where they all intersect and affect each other. Shout out to the Tecolotes. Love the personal stories in that film. I definitely uh, recommend that to our, our viewers as well. And, uh, Stephen, I want to play a little uh, Truth or Wiki real quick with you because when you become, a, you know, a professional rack and torn or res renaissance man to your level they'll they'll write your history publicly on wiki sometimes it's real sometimes it's wrong look you i know the, you have the a net history. worth the net worth i'm not going to answer that one all right okay i know i know that's out there i will not confirm or deny we know your path to, to boxing in, in, in Showtime Sports and, and was, was through being, a, being an attorney. You've worked with Mike Tyson, Oscar De La Hoya. You had a prominent role for a while with Golden Boy Promotions. But looking at your client list on Wiki, uh, Snoop Dogg jumped off, but Gina Carano, I didn't know this. Is this true? And what can you tell us about the time when you were working specifically? It, it, was, it was the tail end of her fighting career and her, the start of her movie career, which has gone um, you, you know, swimmingly well for her. Um, so, uh, I think it picked up, uh, with the cyborg fight, um, you know, which was obviously a big fight for, uh, for Showtime and, and, and for the CBS corporation as a whole and, you know, did the first, you know, few movie deals. And I think, uh, she had gotten, uh, the call from Steven Soderbergh on, uh, for Haywire, which was really a, um, a cold call, you know, out of the blue. And, um, 
you know, she's told the story before, but, uh, you know, the way she told me, she got a sort of call and it, uh, on her voicemail and it was this guy wanting to direct, uh, direct her in the film, wanted to sit down and he said he was a director. And, and in, in retelling the story, she, uh, you know, her manager asked the same question that I did, which is, who, who's the director? And she said, Stephen, uh, so, so, I said, Soderbergh? Steven Soderbergh whole called you on your cell phone to ask you to be in the movie. She's like, yeah, that's it. I'm like, that's a meeting that you must take. And Steven Soderbergh yeah. calls, you take that meeting, particularly if you have no acting history whatsoever. Um, it didn't, you know, didn't have to twist her arm, you know, and the rest is, is history. And, um, you know, I, I think she was, uh, she was great as a client. And I look forward to seeing her more. Yeah, shout out to the work she's done in The Mandalorian as a Star Wars nerd. I've loved that. Luke didn't pop as much as I did when she tried to break the internet with the topless photo, but you know, I, I'm not going to say anything more because every time I talk on an interview, we have to get legal involved. It was a Pat Tillman joke, Luke. Get yeah. over it. All right, uh, Stephen, I love interviewing you because I can ask you the real question. I can hit you no, in the do. gut. Please do. Please do. I count on it. I checks. count on it. That's why I come on. All right. Well, here we go. All right. Um... Do people call you weasel in public? I mean, F that <laughs> Irish guy, but is this a thing, bro? Is this a thing? Um, you know, it, 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 it has happened on occasion. Um, and, and it still surprises me to this day that th there are those. It'll be at the most random places. This is, uh, I think late last year, I was flying back from somewhere for a fight. And I was in uh, a sweats and a baseball cap. It was, I think I was coming back from overseas. It was probably three in the morning. And uh, I'm, I'm getting my bags and I noticed there's a um, one, of, one of the attendants there in, in sort of baggage claim is sort of like just staring and staring. And uh, I thought, I really didn't really figure out. And afterwards, I'm walk off, he, he came over to me and he said, and the kid was, he looked like he was 20 years old. Uh, he, he said, hey, I, I've been trying to figure this out. He said, uh, are you Espinoza? And, and, I, I, and this is this is what we're now going on almost four years later, three years later uh, from the whole thing. And, and I said, yeah, like, how in the world can you possibly you know, recognize me? I'm in a baseball cap. It's three in the morning. I look like hell, like out of context. Why would you be looking? And he's like, oh, I'm a huge MMA fan. And, um, you know, that that was a seminal that entire event. Press stuff was seminal. It's burned into my mind. So I would. Yeah, so, you know. Yeah, I mean, you got caught in the crossfire in one of the biggest events, Mayweather, Mac, uh, McGregor press tour. He gave it to you. I know you had to bite down on the lip hard, but in pro wrestling, they have a term called a receipt, Stephen, all right? Somebody lays in something a little too thick, you keep it in the back of your mind. I'm not <laughs> saying you're going to double leg McGregor one day in public, but are we ever going to get him back? Are we ever going to deliver that receipt here? I, I have a feeling the story's not over yet. Yeah, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll leave right. that for you guys to interpret. I have a feeling this story is not over yet. Okay. There's, there's another, okay. there's an okay. epilogue, there's a coda, there's something here. It, it's, not, it's not quite over. Love it, uh, love it. My, my question for you, and I'll, I'll end here on my side of things, uh, Stephen, not quite as fun as BC's, but still something I think about. Like, we talk about this Bad Hombres documentary, and of course, if you want to see it, you can stream it on Showtime right now. You can go to the website, showtime.com, 30-day free trial if you want to go check it out. But the thing that I, I think about is you can't really tell that story without getting into some of the political considerations, not all of them, but it's just not a story that's really capable of being told effectively or at least comprehensively without it. And I see on social media you have certainly um, political opinions. Mm -hmm. I do too. Dana White has spoken out in favor of Donald Trump. I've not seen you do that specifically for an individual candidate, but here's what I mean to say. It just seems like... We all kind of agree that the barrier between sports and politics has really broken down of late, especially with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, how do you calibrate that? Because there does seem to be like, at some point, I don't want to go too far with it. At some point, things get lost. When you think about how you want to make content for Showtime or how you present yourself to the world, what are those limits? So th the reality is, um, you know, any, any sort of authentic discussion of sports, particularly in the current times, is going to touch on what's going on in society. And, and obviously, there are all kinds of those issues. I, I, you know, what, again, the personal opinion, um, you know, when people say, you know, keep politics out of sports, I think most of the time what they mean is keep politics which don't agree with mine out of sports. 
you know, and, and there is a risk, you know, you don't want to turn off your, your audience for, for any reason. But the same people who um, complain about politics and sports have no problem with, um, you know, the president, for example, uh, inviting the NBA champions or the NHL champions or any uh, sporting team to the White House. They don't have, you know, some of the, the ties that, that happen in UFC. They don't complain about those. So it really, um, you know, how much, you know, people will allow is a, is uh, how much of politics in their sports people will allow is a, is a great question. I think um, we can't bury our sand, our head in the sand. We, we can't ignore it. It is part of the sport. It is part of the individual athletes. So it's not our job to amplify it. Um, and I think that's where you cross the line. If we are making it a bigger issue than it is, then I think we're doing a disservice. But if we are reflecting what is going on in the sport, in, in the lives of individual athletes, then I think that's fair game. And I think it not only can it be covered, I think it should be covered. Um, if you're ignoring that and looking the other way, you're burying your head in the sand on something that's very relevant to what's going on in the world today. Well, with that, I will just remind everyone, if you want to see Bad Hombres, you can go to Showtime.com right now. You can get a 30-day free trial. You can check it out. It's available to be streamed. You can watch it anytime, basically, uh, once you cross that barrier. I'm a, obviously a Showtime subscriber. Hello. And uh, it's a phenomenal documentary, as well as if you're looking for more information about the Davis and Santa Cruz fight, Showtime.com is going to be your place to be because, of course, you can buy that for streaming on the web platform as well. Steven Espinosa, we appreciate your time, the president of Showtime Sports. For Brian Campbell, uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. TV taught me how to dream. It was a life jacket. I don't think you can be an artist and not touch people.